Hi everyone, I welcome you to our very first edition of Café Artistique in 2023. And indeed today it's a very, very special edition. Um, we are waiting, inviting you today to Tales to Inspire, a celebration of creative narration and storytelling. BSBI, one of the fastest growing and progressive educational institutes located in the heart of Europe, in the heart of Berlin, of course has its own story. And I believe, thanks to its progressive and diverse nature, it's now home to many, many young students from all around the world. We are constantly on the move. Innovation, we live. So join us today as we embark on a journey of discovery and inspiration, immerse in the magic of storytelling with our very special guests here. Um, as I mentioned, BSBI has its own story of success, and I'm very pleased and proud to welcome our guests today, key players behind the success. I have on my left here Sagi Hatov, the CEO of Gus Germany, and on my right here, the Provost and Chief Academic Officer um, behind the outstanding educational and scientific success, success of BSBI, Professor Dr. Kuviliotis. And um, of course, we have Andreas Teurer here, one of our lecturers. Um, what would be an educational institute with our frontline lecturers? I'm very, very happy to have you here on board as well. Um, from the depth of the creative industry, uh, we'll talk today uh, about um, Storytelling. Um, storytelling is rooted within all of us. And talking about roots and its foundations, I believe education is a key part of laying these foundations. So I have my first question or my first abstract for you, Professor Kubeliotis. Um, and it's a small abstract from the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to start the discussion with you on this, um, as I said, to lay a foundation for our ongoing discussion about it. And um, in fact, the matter seemed to have been settled long ago, the matter of big stories. As early as 1979, uh, François Lyotard published a book that dispelled the idea of living in an age of binding narratives, La Condition Postmoderne. Postmodern knowledge was the title of his bestseller, as we all know. So Lyotard sees the beginning of modernity as a turning point, and until then, people made their world of fables, myths, and stories. These narratives were a means of creating meaning and were pasted and passed on from generation to generation. Telling meant consolidate, consolidating knowledge. And with the advent of modernity, however, it was about developing scientific evidence and accumulating knowledge, so positivism replaced myth. And my question would be if you agree with this. Well, I can, th first of all, Liz, thanks for uh, having us here, me and uh, our colleagues. Uh, I'm very happy that we have this topic to, to discuss and exchange opinions today, because for me it also uh, depicts on what we experience in real life. And before answering to this, I want to say that if our lifetime is like a big journey, uh, uh, in order to justify our presence in, in this world, this is composed of, of, let's say, small stories. So our, our life journey is a collection of stories. So one of these, probably the one that is more characteristic for the rest of our lives, is the story that we create around education. Once a person said that education is left when everything that we have learned has been forgotten. Mm -hmm. And in the journey that our students have to spend in BSBI, we're also trying to give them an alternative route as well. As you know, in, in our life cycle, we need also, apart from uh, learning, apart from completing degrees and everything else, there are certain things we need to acquire. For example, there is a certain number of books that we all have to read. Maybe it's 100, 200, but we have to. A certain number of soundtracks or piece of music, uh, Sagi Absolutely. can comment yeah. more on this. Uh, uh, certain number of films, certain uh, museums that we have to visit, and, and all these, they complete the inner self. So this is what we need also to project to our students. So this story that they will spend a part of our lives with us, it's mainly about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that will stay for them for the rest of their lives, and it will always be with them. No matter how rich they will come, or the titles they will get, or, or the positions in their lives. Now, coming back to your question. I think 
we are living now in what we call the new meta world. So without being too technical, we live behind what we call the postmodern modern era. We are now experiencing a transitional stage between Industry 4, which is the new industrial revolution, and what comes afterwards. And what comes is not just the metaverse and all these applications, but it's a new reality. And even experiences or bad experiences like COVID pave the way towards another direction. Be more flexible in how we work, how we think, uh, new professions being invented. And as you know, and we, we, we had a reference on this on most of our graduations. Most of, uh, of young children that they finish now primary and they go to the secondary education, when they will have to establish their career in probably 10 or 15 years from now, 80% of the professions, they have not been invented yet. So this is very important and this is why BSBI is also an innovative institution. We want to equip these students, not with these professions because we don't even know, but to all the skills that are necessary for them to become flexible. So my answer to this is the flexibility and how we adjust to any new situation is the key for success. And these famous quotes that you mentioned were written many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. That means some people, they had the charisma to understand what is coming. But now everything is coming faster. And when the world is ready for a change, it happens really, really fast. For example, in the beginning of 1900 in New York, they decided to move the public transportation from carriages with horses to using automobiles with steam. That was 130 years ago. But that change back then happened between four and eight years. And for, for that old age, that was really fast. That was speed of light. Yeah. So if, we, if you say to somebody that, OK, five years ago, people will discover online or remote work or flexible work or any of these, they will probably look at you looking very strange. Mm -hmm. But but this is how we manage to do, we, we adjust. So my answer is that innovation, adjustment and flexibility and skills for the future. It's the story. That's, it's that's the story, the, story yeah. that's, that's the first story that we can experience together with education. Exactly, here. yeah. And it's, I think, about empowerment to write this. And as you mentioned, to set up um, a list of things we might have to read, to listen to, to watch, to formulate the background of the story, to be this flexible mind. And also, Liz, there is another thing which is very important. Most of our students, they ask, OK, what I need to study in order to, to have a job mm -hmm. or to go to the X profession? Mm -hmm. The answer is that you never study just to, to be employed. Mm -hmm. And if you make the right decision, but even if the wrong ones, because we are products of our experiences, at the end of the day, exactly. yeah. if you are flexible and you have an open mind and think out of the box, everything will make sense. Mm -hmm. For example, I studied linguistics. Mm -hmm. I studied international relations and diplomacy in European Union studies. If you isolate these, they don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. They are luxury courses for unemployment. Mm -hmm. But now with the position that I have, they all blend together. Exactly. Because I, I was able, apart from being lucky that meet leaders like, like Sag and the other colleagues mm -hmm. that gave me this opportunity, but you can create something out of this. Yes. Um, and, and, and this flexibility has to be a state of mind. Absolutely, especially so, in this transitional So time, the degree yeah. on its own, it yeah. doesn't mean anything. No. Or the story. It's how you take the story, you narrate it, mm -hmm. and you create a new edition of the story for the, uh, for the next stage. Absolutely. And I, I feel this is the foundation when we, because when, when I want, when, when I thought about the idea to talk about storytelling, all of us, we start from somewhere. So that is our own story, which we are bringing out to the meta, to the, as we are, as we are now. And if you remember, I told you in the past that every story needs to have a narrative mm -hmm. behind it. And, exactly. And it's, it has nothing to do with marketing or how you, you sell a story. It's the narrative and the narrative comes from you. Mm -hmm. It comes from the soul. Everything else, like typical educational qualification or the experience you have here in the classroom, these are things in the process. But, but the narrative is when your heart talks. Yes. And deep down, everybody here knows that when, when they study something and they love it, they will find the way at the end. 
And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned it doesn't come from marketing because this is one of the points which um, when we were ideating about the topic for today is that storytelling the word, narrative, it's being used and used over and over for marketing purposes. Now every, every successful marketing campaign is based on emotions, on narrations, on storytelling. And the idea behind organizing today this special cafe at the stick is to have this very diverse setup we have here. And um, that would bring me also to my next question here, because sometimes when I speak um, to um, industry specialists or, of course, from the creative industry, I hear this word storytelling all the time, but I feel we have forgotten where it comes from. We have forgotten what is the underlying narrative about it. And talking about Greek mythology, um, we have vengeance, we have the hero's journey, and all this is settled within mythology. And we were just mentioning mythology, it's more and more, so we were based on fables, but now it's changing. Um, and even if you take the Greek tragedy, exactly, the there tragedy. is the story, there is all these bad experiences, and then there is what they call catharsis. Mm -hmm. So at the end there is a cycle, mm -hmm. and the hero or the heroes, they become wiser at the end so that they can use it in the future mm -hmm. via a painful way mm -hmm. because according to the, to the tragedy story they have to learn in this painful way but they become wiser exactly so that's it's also a very good reminder to our students so it's, sometimes it's painful but um it's it's a cycle um yeah so i think these are these are very very important points that um we have the notion of tragedy, we have the notion of the hero, we have the notions of love, of course, which is a very, very big part of when we talk about these emotional values of the storytelling. And um, we have heard now a lot from Professor Kovaliotis, like to have a foundation laid for us to kind of move towards where we are right now, which is the contemporary, we call this, this the contemporary where we are settled in, while we are actually in a transitional mode. And um, I would have um, my next question to you, Andreas. Um, as I mentioned, you are located in the heart of the creative industry as a scriptwriter um, for many, many um, big TV productions in Germany or as also in Europe. And um, you have been the co-director of the German version of The Office, um, which was a blockbuster here in Germany. And um, I believe storytelling, the narrative of what we have now just discussed, is a key to success. Because how can you, and I remember it was screened from 2004 to 2012 in five seasons, talking about um, The Office here. So how are you able to like produce or work on a blockbuster that you know, streets were empty here. People were talking about it next day at work, about, um, you know, what they have seen in Stromberg. So this is what it was called. How do you think um, is the power behind it? Or how, how do you, um, as a director, how do you translate a script into a visual, powerful um, tool or yeah. image? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be here with in such a round. Yes, and thank you for your answer. It was very interesting. I, 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 I definitely forgot everything I wanted to tell because I listened. Uh, but, but I want to take one point of Professor, can I say Kuriakos? That yes. makes me Professor Kuriakos. The flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started, I started as a student, as you all here, and, uh, but I started studying econo economy business, but I failed and I said, oh, what a pity. And, but now I can use it. Afterwards, I, I studied uh, film and theater and communication. I did my grade and I made my jobs as an assistant director, as a director. And nowadays when I direct, little films for, for example, the UKA in, in Hamburg, little scientific films. I'm my own producer. And now I can use the knowledge from my economic studies, where I never have thought about I would use it anymore. Now I can use it. Now it made sense that 30 years ago I studied economic and business. I didn't finish it, but I now can make a good calculation and I can say, 
this money, we have this money, we don't have. So this is about flexibility and that it makes all, I also think so that at the end it makes all sense. But your question was, how is it to direct a, a TV series uh, as Stromberg? And also here I could go a bit back to my studies because <laughs> first you said you would ask me something about Jarmusch, Jarmusch. and my, my master in, uh, in, in film I made and I made it about the journey, uh, the motive of the journey in the films of the American director Jim Jarmusch. And I worked a lot of, I worked a lot with the knowledge which I get in the end of my studies. I, I studied, for example, as you mentioned, The Hero's Journey, the, the book of uh, uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, a professor for society science in America, the last century, 1950, he wrote it. And he, he did this circle structure of the hero's journey. And I use the hero's journey for me as a director when I directed Stromberg, because it helped me a lot. It gives me orientation. Where are we? Where, who is our hero? Because, for example, uh, Campbell uses also the, the psychoanalysts like Carl Gustav Jung and Sigmund Freund, and he uses the 12 archetype uh, character design. So I, I asked myself, what is Stromberg uh, for a character? Is he more an explorer? Is he more uh, an innocent? Is he more a hero? Or what is he? And I learned that he is all of them. He is a twister. He is a jester also. He is a sage sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, at the end of a story of every series, he learned a little bit. He begins in the normal world, then he gets a call to adventure, he goes to the special world, and when he comes back, the normal world is just the same. It's, it's like when we go, uh, when we all go at home this evening, our world is the same, but perhaps we learned a little bit, and so we changed, and so we can change the world a bit. So the, the trick is, I think, for every movement in the outer world, you need to uh, find a movement in the inner world. So if your hero, uh, if you see the hero has some action, he has a love interest or something like this, you have to find out, does he make this journey in the outer world also in the inner world? And then does it come to an end? Because in a TV series, you always have 30 minutes and after 30 minutes, there's an end. Perhaps there's a cliffhanger or something like that, but it's finished and you, you have to give the people an end. And this is the, the way to, to, which helped me a lot to direct it, and that's uh, an advice to all the students on the, on the air and here. Uh, every basic knowledge you get in your studies, everything you do in your research work, every references, every role models you find, every archetypes you find, storytelling archetypes, we will hear a lot uh, today also about music, you will, perhaps you, couldn't use it for the project you, you, you searched it, but you can use it for the next project or perhaps for a personal project, yeah? But you will use it because it goes from your conscious to your subconscious and it becomes part of your personality. And that's what a lot is about when you direct a, a series, when you work with actors, uh, and when you form out of an actor uh, an, a, a character mm -hmm. which should function in a TV series. Mm -hmm. And for, for us, to be honest, I, I didn't wrote mm. uh, Stromberg. I just directed it because written was uh, the, uh, the writer is named Ralf Hussmann and mm -hmm. he wrote all the Stromberg things and the, the office is wrote by Ricky Gervais and Steve Merchant. They invented it, we adapted it. Perhaps we stole it a bit because we were the ones who didn't call it the office mm -hmm. in the USA or in other countries. It's called the office. We called it Stromberg and we only were inspired by the office. But, uh, you know, it's uh, like Picasso said, good artist copy, genius artist steal. <laughs> and, uh, but but they, they, it was an amount of money and then we were inspired. Imagine if you have written The Office during the pandemic, how different the series yeah, would be. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And home office. Home yeah. office. <laughs> but it would be very interesting. Office. It would be very interesting. And uh, as you know, for example, 
the office only had two seasons. They finished after two seasons. We made six Five seasons movies. and a cinema yeah. movie at the yeah. end at 2000 cent. And, and the USA office, they made nine. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's so different in, in those, uh, even this, uh, uh, topic. The office is in the other in different cultures. I read yesterday because I googled a bit to mm -hmm. be on air again. In India, in the moment they shoot the office, I'm very interested to see this. Okay. Now, Twenty years later, yeah. so yeah. it's very very exciting for me. And yeah. it was for me a big big chance because, uh, as you said, we we began with the office in 2002. And I finished to work with Christoph Maria Herbst, the actor of Stromberg, in 2016 because we developed uh, the, the idea of this character Stromberg when we finished uh, the Stromberg TV series and the cinema, we put him in the internet and we did for ProSieben, Sat1 in Munich, internet series for their uh, merchant employees and so, so that they, uh, uh, the, 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 the Stromberg uh, was explaining them the world of merchandising and so on, the world of advertising. And so I worked at least 14 years with this idea and it's one idea. And the hero's journey of yeah, Christoph and the Maria hero's journey, Herbst. which exactly. I uh, learned in my studies. Yeah. So, so I think this it's is good to study. This is yes, it's very good to study, and yeah. I think it makes a very, very important connection of what Professor Kuliotis also yeah. mentioned. This flex Absolutely. I mean, this, this, this is flexibility, and it's this that 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 it's like you you put it together. That it's you a, might not feel now for what do I need it, but the study of the hero's journey in your study, yeah. then the connection to Jarmusch. Yeah. It is the foundation for your later success to be the co-director of Stromberg. Yeah. And, and you, you, you always have to The ask way it. you approached yeah. it, the way you approached this very difficult character of Stromberg. Yeah, but, but you have to ask yourself, perhaps there are similarities of Johnny Depp playing mm -hmm. Depp Man in Jarmusch mm -hmm. and Christoph Maria Herbst playing Stromberg in Stromberg. In Stromberg and and yeah. you find them yeah. because, as Campbell argues, in every story, even if it's a fairy tale or it's a dream, uh, a patient told his uh, psychoanalyst like Jung or there is this, a similar mythological basis. Mm -hmm. And if you are able to find this basis, you can work with it. Mm -hmm. And for me as a director, it is very, very important to see this basis because I have to make decisions all the time, mm -hmm. like you too and you too. Every day we have to make decisions right, left. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I direct a TV series, I have to decide who, who which is the actor who plays the role. And when I have an actress who plays the role, I have to decide, does she wear a red uh, uh, suit or does she wear a blue suit or whatever. And I, I have to work out a, a structure which gives me a help to make my decisions. And these are the archetypes. When I find a role archetype for this role, I know how to behave and to act as a director. Where we go back to mythology, yeah. archetype, the archetype, yeah. where we all, knowing or unknowingly, we grew up with yeah. these archetypes yeah. and we are continuously... Yeah, we, I, we should I'm, continue I'm a child of the 80s. Yes. I'm <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and so most of us are, um, but uh, like a child of a certain decade in time and formulate our archetypes then build our story based on this, yeah. yes. And I, I completely agree with you because I, even in this TV series, I think it was a very specific outline, the style, the set. And um, just, I remember that hairstyle of, of Stromberg, which I think was already telling its own story for itself. Um, um, and I mean, I don't know, he had to run around with this kind of hairstyle for yeah. many, many years. <laughs> Liz, regarding the 80s, yes. especially the hairstyle, yeah. we all yeah. want to leave this behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I will not get <laughs> into this. Some of the clothes, the glasses and the hairstyles in the 80s. <laughs> uh, I think millennials are very, very happy with it. Okay. But everything else, especially the music, uh -huh. was amazing. Yeah, I've, yeah. That's yes. true. I mean, that also I kind of grew up with, but... Uh... It will come back. That's why there is a gap in my photo album. <laughs> yeah, it will come back. A gap in the story. <laughs> in the storyline. No, I mean, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Andreas. I think um, that gave us a very good insight into um, how does education formulate yeah. the later developments that changes. I mean, that TV series changed at least for... 
I think, yeah, from UK to US to uh, within Europe, it was then adapted all over. I think, yeah, so these, these are, you know, uh, important points. Um, I don't know whether I can call it civilization, but it, no. I, I'm, <laughs> but um, no, I want to I want to make a very I want to make a link a cliffhanger now, as you said, to yeah, something it, which is crucial for our civilization. It's, it's part of our pop culture. Pop culture, exactly. Pop culture. But there's something which is crucial for being a civilized human being, and yeah. it brings me to classical music and to Sagihatov, of course. Um, Thank you once again, Sagi, for uh, being with us today. Um, classical music. Um, when I was pre when I prepared for this edition of uh, Café Artistique, and um, it was actually thanks to Professor Kiriakos that he mentioned, why don't we also have Sagi on board? And I thought, of course, the narrative, the storytelling, it is classical music. Right. Music provokes emotions in us. And I think all of us, we know that moment, we hear something in the radio, we stream or something, and there's a piece of music and particularly as you just mentioned the music of the 80s all of a sudden it appears and we get transferred back into a certain moment of time a certain moment memory. a memory a certain moment of our yeah storyline and i believe you're one of the people among us here who can share a lot more how i mean it is to compose and then from that composition to translate it same like Andreas does it from a script into the moving image and for you how do you translate into your tool which is the cello so first of all good afternoon and thank you for all of you and wonderful to see today our Hamburg students arriving here so welcome to them too um, it is very much uh, connectivity between a human soul to how they perform and how they connect with the music. There is always the one who writes the script, is the composer in this case, and the one who is the bad guy who is supposed to perform it to the script level, but always put his own interpretation, and that's called the artist. Because a good artist will always add a, an a adding value, and a, just a performer will just play the piece as it's written. To be honest, every computer is a performer, mm -hmm. but artist is, is the one who had the value and you recognize him because he has a very uh, distinguished uh, way of performing, the way of delivering it. And then in music, for example, it's come with a lot of emotions. Your job is to transform people from just like we are today into a completely different atmosphere, happiness, sadness, upset, scared, the, the films allowing you to, to go via visual to these events, but you can see something happening, someone falling down the stairs and you laugh, or you see something really tragic happen and you cry, but with the music it's allow your emotions to go out freely, to burst out, and that's the power of music, because without the power of music and you take a horror film, and I think everyone watched a horror film in their lifetime. Imagine you watch a horror film without music. Mm. It's not scary anymore. Mm -hmm. True? The music and the anticipation, uh, uh, you know, when the door is open, you mean, and then there is a music <laughs> behind it. You say, oh my God, something really bad is going to happen. Imagine a Hitchcock film. It, I was like just psycho. Hitchcock. I or, mean, or, I was just thinking about that anything. scene. But yeah. And this it, is classic though. Uh, absolutely. It reminds me my mother one day came with me to one of my performances. Actually, your mother a, probably watching, so be careful this, uh, what you yeah. say. It, it wasn't a horror film to have my mother coming to see me performing because as a performer, you don't care how many people are watching you. But she said to me, uh, after performing uh, in, in a, me a memorial event, as a young person, I needed to make money. So I used the music. You said you learned something from your bachelor in economics. I had to learn how to get more gigs, more jobs. Yeah. So if I made people laugh, I would get jobs. If I will make people cry, I will get more jobs. So it's the extreme emotions that will get the more jobs. And I did a lot of memorials uh, uh, events because I knew I managed to get a lot of gigs because people managed to cry for along my playing. And my mom saw me in this event and she said, how are you able to get all of these gigs? What are you doing? I want to come to see what you're doing. 
And we're coming to the event, a very important person, unfortunately, passed away. It was a month after. And I see his picture, and I see the family, and I'm just playing. And after a few minutes, I, of course, everyone starts crying. And I know all the things, how to make them cry. Mm. And I know that's amazing. I'm going to win good uh, uh, bonus, <laughs> good tip for it. And I'm looking at my mom, and she's also crying. So what's going on in here? You're not supposed to cry. You don't know the guy. Mm. And at the end of the uh, event, I go to her, why did you cry? I don't know. You make me like I knew him forever. So the, this is one of the things that music can actually make you connected to the storytelling, to the atmosphere that you want to create. We talked about El King before. So all these horse ridings and all of this with the piano and all these emotions and the shouts to his father by Goethe, yeah? that's created that feeling that you are there, you are riding on this horse. And when the father and the music stop and he says, my son is dead in that poetry, that's very much powerful and you feel like shivering on your skin and you, you feel, oh my God, I'm part of this now. And it doesn't matter how many years old this music or the written, the poetry itself, it's all connected to each other. So there are lots, lots of musics and events like that that I can remember, a mm -hmm. lot of them. I want to ask something, yeah, Saki, yeah. which I always wanted to ask you. In, in many cultures, the best uh, music that has ever been written, not, not in most, but it, not in all, but in most, it's been products of something tragedy, or from, from, from written from people that they suffered. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first part, of, especially folk music. Mm -hmm. in, in other types, like in classical music, do we observe something similar? So is it actually the human emotions that they, they revoke some inner talent that we have inside and they push us, create something like this? Which actually, that means it's a personal story, a personal narrative that we manage to put into a musical uh, part and then uh, it becomes also the narrative of other people. Because those songs that some of, some of us, we don't know how they came from, mm -hmm. which is probably out of a personal tragedy, but, but we, we, we connect this with our own stories. Although mm -hmm. the start point was something different. It was a completely different story. It's different so person, is, is this yeah. something applicable to all music? In a way, all musics have happy and sad, and it depends on the complicity. If you are a graduate of the academy like myself, you, you look at folklore or pop music as, not as a secondary, but you see it as a more simple music. When you see certain uh, compositions in a very sophisticated harmonics and uh, structure, you see it in more academic, more structured, more challenging music. But at the end, the, the aim is the same, to make you feel attached to the music. You know, there was uh, one event which you mentioned tragedy connect very well with people. So during the Second World War, as we know, this country had a lot of to do with this, when uh, people went to the gas chambers or anything related to their end, the idea was if you put music before those places, people will feel cheerful. So they put klezmer musicians to play happy music, and the immediate effect of the people who went to the gas chambers thought, I'm going to something good, I'm going for sure, I'm going to be happy now. And they were happy to walk. The, the tragedy was actually to the musician who played something music, but in their hearts they knew this is the end. And this is how that music became a tragic at the end, which psychology comparison that, now when you hear this music, you feel actually sad, when it was supposed to be a wedding music, celebration music, and all of that. So music can mean a lot of things for you and for me in different ways. The same uh, piece of art can say to me happiness and for someone else sad. For me it can be something cheerful and for someone else a tragedy. Depends how we hear it first. If someone hearing certain music from a childhood of, you know in the school break we have these beautiful simple songs, we're talking about the 80s, kids of the 80s. So I'm definitely a kid of the 80s. And I remember going to my school and I'm listening to all these funny ringtones on the playground. 
for me it was fun, but for a child who'd been abused or been bullied in school, that's probably mm -hmm. mean a really bad music to listen to. And all these effects are our life, psychology. Music therapy is very fascinating on its own because via music you can, you can draw as a child, we used to do these tricks, saying, listen to this music and draw what you feel. And many people drew what they had problems with. So Kiriakou said their sadness, they drew a tragedy. Mm -hmm. So you could see what's happening at home or what bothered the person in life. And he listened to music that actually allowed him to, to come. And we also, all of us know that when we go to a spa, we are not going to, go, to hear you two and uh, you know, some rock band. We're going to hear very calm, music that allow us to relax, maybe even to fall asleep. The reason for that is exactly the same. It's like a yoga music to, to relax and to reflect and to be uh, peaceful. All of these things allow us to create our own story in our mind. Our mind is the biggest storytellers ever exist. We can come up with ideas that are not even exist and perhaps can happen and we can come up with uh, great ideas too. I will tell you a trick, okay? Mm -hmm. Because music can also do something brilliant. We can rewrite our personal experiences. For example, when I was younger, I lived in London, okay? And I was so happy and exploring the museums and work at the same time and go shopping and all this. So I was listening to a particular, uh, well, couple of songs of Elton John back then, okay? Mm -hmm. and I was very happy. And I, whenever after these years I, I heard these kind of songs, I had these images yeah, in front of exactly. me. Of London. Yeah. So, yes. Of London. So, yeah. And also me being younger and anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> once that I was feeling very happy here in Germany, I decided to do the, the trick. I replayed all this. Mm -hmm. and, and because these were connected to also happy moments here, since I hear this again, now I have new memories. Exactly. So it's like a self-therapy. And if music can do this for you, then also a film can do, uh, a book, a, book can do. a poem. Mm -hmm. There are all cultures that are very lucky and their composers, they use the products of their best poets yes. or writers. Yeah. Not, lots of, not lots of cultures are very, young, are very lucky to have this. And if you take, you mentioned you too, uh, if you take some of the lyrics and you try to translate them, it's not a great poem, let's say, okay? But, but imagine if you manage to combine all this. Mm -hmm. And then you have a talented director, mm -hmm. or even you have a painter, mm -hmm. or an art designer, and in put another part as well. And now, because of the, of the technology and the meta world, we have the opportunity to make all these experiments and build new things uh, in a matter of seconds that we didn't have in the past. As we, as we are going to do with the hologram we have downstairs. Okay. Which means that if you have the script, let's say of Gandhi, teaching about British colonialism in India mm. 200 years ago. And you have his hologram and invite him as a guest professor or guest lecturer in your lecture and have all the students learning from him or learning from Adenauer or Jean Monnet about the history of the European Union by a hologram. But yes, what, what is behind all this? And this memory you will never forget. No, definitely and it's a unique not. experience. Just and when you have a medical course, to have Fleming dis discuss about penicillin mm -hmm. or the Higgs particle, how about himself being in the classroom and teach you about this? So, a hologram he will so that's why I hologram, said even, yeah. even technology created its own methodology, so it's not a helping tool anymore. Uh, yeah. Bringing uh, people back to life is very effective for young people because they're only reading about them in books. Yes. And the concentration of young generation today is not what it used to be in the 80s young generation. Mm -hmm. We read more because there were less good TV programs. Mm -hmm. There were not so many games. Mm -hmm. Who had the money to buy at that time such an electronic game? So we play outside more, more than playing inside. And, and that's the main thing. Today, the technology allows us to bring these people back to life in a way and to be alongside the professor, not instead of the professor. And this is the uh, amazing uh, tool. Because the idea in education should be that we guide you. We don't tell you we guide you. 
and you learn yourself because without the self-learning it's really difficult so you, you you everyone can read a book but not everyone understand what they read so the the opportunity is for the professor to direct you to the right end but to guide you in a way that you still experience what you are learning this is this is the hardest one the same in music there are lots of uh, my teacher used to say to me there are lots of cabinets to open you need to find which one cure the problem for your student which one he will understand and be able to progress forward uh, uh, without the issues mm. and not everyone understand even at the same level because uh, you know in music it's a bit more aggressive you see it immediately in arts we have today lots of artists when you do drawings and other skills it's it's straight in the face you see the results so not always it's perfect so you can correct it but in uh, business studies in uh, in different uh, like IT and others it's a bit more complex it takes time to find the mistakes because it's not as explored exposed and that's the, the the uniqueness the creativity of teaching those things these subjects and I, I believe although in all what we have as educational um, uh, foundation is sometimes I feel and it was mentioned here in the round I sometimes look back at my education and feel it's a chest of drawer. And sometimes I n need to be able to pull the right drawer. For me, like you said, you pulled out that drawer when you were challenged with the task yeah. for that TV series. It's a bit like the archetypes. It's the mentoring. Right? You have a mentor and you have to understand that archetypes, that role archetypes are not uh, stable. You can mm -hmm. change them. Exactly. Sometimes you're the mentor, yes, sometimes you're the ruler, that. sometimes yes. you're the hero, sometimes you're the innocent. And you, you can change that. And I, I just want to yeah, add yeah. something about the music because for me, music is pure magic. I, I, could, I can't understand music. I love music. I love sitting there. Uh, hearing music, but I, if I would able to compose music, I wouldn't sit here, or perhaps as a music expert and not as a film director. And as you said, this with the hologram, it's very interesting. Uh, an old friend of mine, Tom Tikva, mm. Berlin director, very made famous. a film, a hologram for a king with mm. uh, who was the main role? Uh, it was uh, ah, very, very, ah. very, very, very famous. Very famous. In, um, the, in the in in Saudi Arabia or yeah in Saudi in the Arabia desert. the one oh, who come on uh, Forrest Gump who played For, yes uh, Tom, uh, not Tom, Tom no not Tom no, not Tom, 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 Tom Hanks, Hanks. Yes. yes ten yes. points yes. ten yeah. from ten <laughs> so with Tom Hanks and and <laughs> yes, this this place with this idea of the hologram they say we bring you a hologram for the king but what I wanted to add is that Tom is a person who makes the music for his films by himself yeah. and he's a composer by himself and you see it in his films because he can give this musicality in his directing like uh, we had Charlie Chaplin was, yes, also, a was also a composer or yeah. when you see the late films of Clint Eastwood he composed it also by himself so music and film are, are really similar in their way of uh, in their language and when you can bring this together you you be a big ma magician I, I yeah. would to end mm. this. Mm. And yeah, there are other, be, because you said Hitchcock, uh, Bernard Herrmann is a composer of Hitchcock, and Bernard Herrmann, for example, made also the music for Spielberg's Jaws. And mm. I don't know if you know the story, the jaw doesn't work in Jaws, mm. so Spielberg couldn't show the jaw. So 60 minutes of this film, we don't see the jaw and only hear the music of Bernard mm -hmm. Herrmann, mm -hmm. and we are frightened. We, we say the jaw is coming. The, like the, the Rosemary's baby. That yeah, you never see yeah, the baby. You, you never see the baby. That, that's ma magic. That, that, but that's a storytelling and that's this archetype storytelling because they are really heroes of storytelling. They can make you fear without seeing the object of fear, only with the music. It's, um, like Sagi described, it's for, I mean, my background is from the fine arts and it requires, of course, same like in any creative industry, years of training. And when I share, I mean, both of us, all of us, we, we, we lectured, have experience in lectures, lecturing, and still have the chance of lecturing. It's always when I talk about education, it's not to impose or to overshadow something. I think sitting inside a lecture hall is sharing knowledge. 
is um, empowering people and building this community of, of, of knowledge. As I said, this, this picture of a chest of drawer where you can then pick and, and, and be um, mindful about that tomorrow there could be a new technology which I have never thought about because it's invented by somebody else. So when we talk, um, especially in trades of animation, um, I always tell my students, please don't be bound to a certain software, mm -hmm. to a certain whatever tablet you have, because tomorrow it might not be there. Yeah. It might, um, the, 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 the production might stop for it. And how will you do? So learn the trade and be enlightened enough that you can do and your the method. Exactly, yeah, the, the method. method. Yeah, the and method is important. For example, when, when you do a PhD, let's say doctorate, yeah. uh, that means First, you have to contribute something unique in global knowledge. Uh, and then, when you embark on this journey, on this, on this story, for a couple of years, you will be the most specialized person on Earth for this particular topic. After five years, you would have forgotten everything. <laughs> and then, even if you remember, there will be another guy that will continue from where you left, okay? And there will be something new. Uh, but what is left inside you is the methodology. Mm -hmm. And because of this, you can go to a company or go to an educational institution, get a higher role because you have the mentality and the proper approach. Yeah. Because everything in your life is a collection of projects. And I say this in a positive way. So it's exactly what you said. That's why I said it's not the technology that leads or that helps. It's a methodology. It's a methodology. Use it. Now you use this. Then it's going to be artificial intelligence. But yeah. It's artificial and intelligence. That doesn't mean they go together. It doesn't work yet to substitute us. So on the other hand, it's not an enemy. Mm -hmm. So for the good or for the worse, we need to, to take the positive things, build the narrative that we discuss, and move on. And then only positive things can happen. Absolutely. No, yeah. and um, this is required, I think, for all of us to formulate decisions to um, when Sagi mentioned, so his, his, his goal was um, how do I create a certain emotion? I mean, there was first of all, like when we come from the creative industry, we all know the trade. It's difficult to get gigs, it's difficult to get inside a gallery, it's difficult to be the director of something, and it's always because there's, I mean, the creative industry is an immensely competitive industry. And um, so whenever I talk to, to young students or to aspiring students, I say, so you are a very selected group, so make the most of the possibilities of education. You're sleepy today, you don't want to go to school or to lectures or whatever, yes, but it's, it's, part, of what, it's, it's part of something, you know? So imagine if you would have not gone and not learned about this hero's journey, what would you have done? So it, it, it's a missing part of that plot. And um, so that's why I believe it's, it's very important and it requires, it's the beginning of something. Um, it's the beginning of, of, of the, the career which is waiting there, which we all might not know what's there. When I graduated, I never, I never thought I, go, I will go into the fine arts. I never had the idea. It was, it was something I just stumbled into, which is a bit uh, of a strange case because so many tell me, so we tried, we tried so much, and how did you just stumble into? And um, for me, then I realized maybe it's an accumulation of something that I have done in my studies. And the connection of everything. The you connection know, the of the everything. Yeah, look where we are. This is a modern environment, okay? Yeah. But look at the foundation. Very, very old. It smells fresh painting. Look how, how well mm. they, they go together. Yeah. So that's the old experience that are the foundation for everything new and they work together. Mm -hmm. yeah. With contemporary technique because we stream it. I mean, <laughs> we are talking about mythology. And we're able to share it all we globally. Are, yeah. It all able blends together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, have you any idea how the world would have been? If we had the streaming, all the social media and the web pages and everything else 100 years ago. Mm. So keep this thought and think how the world, now that we have this, how it's going to be 100 years in the future. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter will see it perhaps. <laughs> yes, but it's true. But I, I, I remember. There will be a time that a consciousness, yes. because this is, what we, this is how we distinguish mm -hmm. ourselves, okay? It will be in a computer, definitely. And then you can potentially have an artificial body, which it doesn't really matter, uh, because it's tri tri triviality. Yeah. But, but this, the ability to think that I have opposite you, 
and we are here, and all of us, and we share all this experience and everything you have learned to be able to live forever. Yeah. And, and here the, the, the mythological basic knowledge also helps us because when we understand that not only the hero is on a hero's journey, so also the humankind is on a journey mm -hmm. and we are on this earth on a journey and we don't know, we, perhaps somebody knows, I don't know, where this journey will go, but it's a big journey we are on and the earth moves and so everything is in movement and that's for me makes film so special and a good medium because it's a medium which can picture the movement the outer movement and the inner movement and we are on the move you know on uh, bsbi we have every month a movie night and we have poetry matinees and literatures. Ah. so we selected a certain number of films because of the general yeah. education aspect i told you the first one we have seen was Citizen Kane. Oh. Mm. We did that on purpose. Yeah. Not yes. because everybody is the, it's the most uh, important film ever, but it, inside Citizen Kane, you can teach things. Yeah, great things. I, I tell great, you a yeah. secret. It's a secret that doesn't go out on the street. I think we'll say <laughs> to the, <laughs> the office. <laughs> the office stole from Citizen Kane. The fake newsreel, you know, the fake newsreel in Citizen Kane mm -hmm. when Citizen Kane meets politicians? Mm -hmm. Forrest Gump stole it when Forrest Gump meets politician and Forrest Gump. It's the same fake interviews we did in Stromberg. It's fake documentary. So this is the structure we copied it and it goes further on and on and so it's very uh, that you have to see Citizen Kane when you want to do a TV series nowadays because there's so much in it that you can transform in the contemporary world Impressive. yes yeah. I mean I mean I I could I think move on in this panel way before the evening it's so interesting second. and i mean i myself had so many memories released when we were talking just about talking about london and talking about these ideas like, i mean I, I don't know how many years it took me when i exhibit something in a gallery and you, you imagine there's people coming to see whatever you hang on the wall it's it's you it's like it's mm. the accumulation of what we have been discussing about and it's still nowadays to me something very very um, unusual when I know that people come to an exhibition of mine, come to a play, a concert, uh, like yeah. to a concert of the yours, same, and exactly and it's 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 something I think when I talk to my students is the time somebody invests to look at what you created is something you cannot ever replace yes. if you have ever been a creator. And they pay for it. And they pay for <laughs> it uh, a lot <laughs> sometimes. And um, I think this is the gift we have. And being in an educational institute, this is what I would like to give young students, young creatives, young yeah, I mean, this is what we want to share with them here at BSBI, anywhere else in the world where there's education offered. It's a way of empowering somebody. It's a way for all of you to um, build what we have been just discussing about, to build these, these, these pieces of your own story, of um, being equipped for the future. And um, creativity is a big part. It's becoming more and more important. We discussed it, flexibility, um, being enlightened and not let technology take over because then I think we just have, then it is, um, there's a lot of discussion about the metaverse and this and that and how much it will take over. I think we have to stay on top of it. The same way we stay on top of technological gadgets. We have to just adapt to it. We have to be mindful about it. Because everything is a matter of perception. Exactly. If you think that the metaverse or the avatars or the hologram is what fr the fridge did to your milk or to your meat in order not to be rotten or spoiled, then you will be happier. And then if you have this type of mentality, that means to use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you allow it to substitute you, then it's your fault. It has nothing to do with a machine that only is programmed to do something, which you did actually. But, but, but use it to save time. Absolutely. Uh, uh, now you can preserve your milk for a week because a week. you have the because fridge. In the past they have huge blocks of ice. Yeah. It's not the same. So we gain time. Okay, so we have to use all this for our benefit to do other things. And what is the yeah. most precious commodity on earth now? It's not gold. It's not oil. It's time. Mm -hmm. 
And not because it doesn't come back. It's time, and time costs more than money. And mm -hmm. in a certain time in the future, we can find probably a currency for time as well. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, probably Switzerland will be the first yeah. one to come up with this idea. <laughs> Now it's out in the open, yes, most <laughs> probably. Um, no, absolutely. And um, it was a wonderful panel discussion we had. I think a wonderful um, set of guests we had here today. And I, as I said, Before you, yes. you come, I think there is something very important here. We are living in a storytelling. Um, when I came to Hamburg, uh, this is personal to say, and I saw this amazing group of students with an amazing uh, exhibition and uh, how a brand new faculty comes together with so many nationalities which are around uh, and uh, sitting in a very special city like Hamburg and creating. Uh, I said, this one day will become as big as this campus, one day. And this is how it started here in Berlin. And this is part of the story. It's part of the story. We yes. see how this amazing story is growing beautifully in Hamburg, in France, soon in Athens, and of course in a in couple of months in Barcelona. This is really something that we can be part, but at the same time, we can design this storytelling in the direction that we think it's right for the future generation and for the best benefit. Everyone can teach arts and design, everyone can teach an MBA and business. But the uniqueness is how you bring people to have the best equipment for life, best experiences, and to cherish something for them, to remember. Now we cannot say that all of us here remember everything from university, true? We cannot really. Maybe we remember a teacher, maybe we remember a project, maybe we remember even a sentence. But it's always hard to remember the whole degree that we studied and everything that it taught us. I think giving to such a Generation Z, we call it, this ability to consume, to experience, and to feel, to be part of something special, that will remain in their brain and in their hearts for years from now, until they will be in our age and above that. So I really wish you and the whole team from Hamburg that came today, the same story taller that we had here. Perhaps Hamburg doesn't have as old building from 1905. <laughs> they did not survive the war perhaps, but Hamburg is a very unique place with endless opportunities. And it is for the students and for the team to know how to create these diamonds from the rock. So, Wish you all the very best of luck and to make it happen as well for all of you. Thank you very much. And we appreciate your support, Sagi. We appreciate your support, Professor Kuliotis. And uh, I told um, our students it's kind of coming home today here. It's because BSBI is in Berlin. It's not far, but um, yes, we are in Hamburg. But still, I think today what the students have experienced is a lot of warmth, a lot of care from the team in Berlin. And um, this is what I said, the beauty, it's, it's something that is growing. And uh, something that each and every student and the students who were last year, and I told them last year, part of that exhibition is the first batch of BSBI's own Faculty of Creative Industries. And just look what they have created, what they triggered on all of us to have this invitation today, to have the special edition of Café Artistic. It's done by the students and the students share every day with me. We have ideas for this, we have ideas for that. They have amazing opportunities coming up and um, I think this is the beauty and this is what I think the core of BSBI is. I said it in the beginning, we are moving constantly, we are Very innovating. Innovative, yeah. We are I innovating. Don't know what's the beauty of that? We have created a culture in the school, no matter if it's in Berlin or Hamburg mm -hmm. or in Athens or in Paris, that it's so powerful mm -hmm. because we are, are so different that we can move this mentality and the fact that we're in Berlin, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. We can be in Toronto next month and operate the same and, and have the same community framework uh, and the same exchange of ideas. And this is, this, if we're a company, it's like a corporate culture, but we are above that. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. Maybe tomorrow we will open something new in London. 
it's not important. What is important is the bond and how we manage to work like a positive United Nations, because this is what we are. Yeah. So even, even us, the four of us, or the, the, the guests that were here with us, or the student community. This is amazing. We will not realize this now, but after a couple of years. This is something that adds value to the students. When they graduate and will start their professional career, they already have experienced a multinational environment. Yeah. This is not easy to find. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like your kid, when he's five and goes to primary school, go to an international community. Yeah. Our generation, we had to wait 20 years to experience this. Such and, a diversifying... Exactly. And we're even lucky because of the existence of the EU. Other cultures, they didn't. So it's unique. And, and with my last thought, okay? No, no, it's, oh. One of the first poems that we read in the school, and I, I'm, I want to mention this because I want everybody to, to have a look at this, it was Kipling's If, mm -hmm. which also depicts the methodology and the tranquility that we want to transfer to our students. And I invite you to read the If. And this is exactly what we want to give to the students here. Hamburg, Berlin, Athens, and Paris. So thank you, Liz, for the wonderful opportunity. It was a very nice closing, uh, Professor Kuliotis. And um, I have uh, online a lot of salutes to this round. And um, I have questions coming up. And I believe it will also open up to our very nice audience here. We mentioned it several times. We have the Hamburg creative students today um, being invited to Berlin. And it was a wonderful day so far. They left a gift um, straight from their hearts with the Berlin campus, which is two beautiful murals downstairs. I saw them actually showing what it stands for. It's a home for the global creative talent and um, what uh, we have now. And you will see a mural consisting of um, different animals uh, um, kind of characterizing uh, um, yeah, the different nations they're coming from. It's, it's done in, in a certain style, and um, I hope the students here will enjoy it. And um, it's just a gift from the Hamburg students that you will all remember us uh, on an everyday basis. And um, yeah, what, what I can do now is I can thank you wholeheartedly for this really nice experience, which I wish we could have had more time, but yeah, we talked about time <laughs> as a precious item. And um, I think we can open up to the audience uh, for the questions and uh, maybe uh, I will give also to online uh, a chance. So we have a question here, um, um, which is, Sagi, I believe for you. So is it possible that music has positive effects to the body? Um, music therapy. Yes, I believe. Um, like playing or like, yeah, is it released by a simple melody but when you hear? So I think that's the question if I... If we can. I, I think that, uh, like we said before, music creates a, a, a chance for emotional to go a bit more uh, extreme. And the body has shapes, face has uh, movements. So when you hear something uh, too loud, you immediately, when you hear something really enjoyable, you enjoy it. When you hear a coffee music, you know, mm -hmm. when you're entering Starbucks or anything like that, you immediately think about the smell of a coffee, even if you're not in Starbucks, but you hear that jazzy beats with, that reminds you. Music can bring the sense of smell, the sense of pain, the sense of happiness, and, and, and that basically allows you to react. For the musician, it's exactly the same. You go into, a, like an actor, into a, a new environment. Every music is a different actor, different uh, behavior. So it allows you to react differently. One cannot be still when they yeah. perform. No, absolutely. I mean, this is why we dance, or this yeah. is why we at <laughs> least... <laughs> Not every music you can dance to, but that's, that's true. okay. But at least something is visible, like you said. It could be a facial emotion. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I remember, I think it was nearly eight years ago, uh, I went to the uh, Royal Ballet Opera mm -hmm. in, like, in Covent Garden, mm -hmm. and there was, it was very difficult to find tickets, but I were lucky. And it was the Swan Lake mm -hmm. of Tchaikovsky. Uh, and there was a part in, in the show that I, I literally say, I can die now. It ca you couldn't be any happier. Because of the whole thing and the whole experience, I still remember that. 
uh, and this is something that you can always keep it with you. Uh, and, and that means we, we also are products of our feelings. And sometimes when you need an extra motivation or you want to bring back a happy memory, you go back to one of the stories of your life. Yes. Yes. And this can keep you going. Yeah. As an advice. Yes. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That makes film such a great medium because, as you said, you can see Citizen Kane today. This film is 80, 90 years old. Imagine how happy I felt when uh, one of our students said, I went home and I talked to my parents and I told them, today in the university we have seen this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. Yeah, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And it, it brings generations together. Mm -hmm. When, when yes. the young generation sees or hears this contemporary or I old I spent music. the whole evening thinking just that. Yeah. And I was very happy. And I think us educators probably have the best job in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not because we say something and everybody else takes some notes. Mm -hmm. the, because we have the chance to influence the, the life of other of people course. in the most sensitive age. Yes. And those of us that will have a positive impact will be remembered in their lives after when we're gone. Yeah, that's right. There are not lots of professions that they can have. Yeah. They, they are so lucky. Yeah. It's a precious time mm -hmm. and a precious and responsible position. Yeah. Big we have. power. Yes. So I have um, just, I would like to open to the audience in case you have any questions. Um, there was a lot of content. Um, just, I believe, raise your hands, so we have the microphone going around, otherwise... But this doesn't have to stop here, because, no. you know, we're very open to anything, so mm -hmm. if you think something, you want to contribute something, you have an idea, uh, we're always open, of our course. emails, our phones, everything. So it's mm -hmm. then off air, so if anybody prefers that. Um, there are some questions, I think. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry that we have to turn our back, but it's the theatrics of the yes. setting. So, yeah. Hello. Good evening. My name is Kumar. Uh, my question is both of you that uh, uh, the storytelling as includes history also. I believe. Thus, if you tell the story to someone, they start believing and they start living into the history. So how will you convince the young mind that the, this story is for you and this is not for you? So which, one, which is suitable for you? The positive characters from the stories. So basically the students are the very fascinating about the stories. So they always believe that this character belongs to me or something like that. So they always pick the negative one. So how will you convince those uh, young minds that uh, this is not for you? I have an answer for you. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going to use what Socrates used how to, to, teach, uh, to teach young students although many thousand years ago. The answer is not to give your own version of history or of a story and, and because you're the professor and they are the students to be dogmatic. Mm -hmm. You need to say the version that you believe but you need to keep it so open and give them such incentives that they go themselves and do research around it. And then they can select which version they want. Because the thing is to create more questions to them than giving them answers that you probably believe, which are based on which country you are from, which culture you are from, of, or what personal experience you have. And I will give you a very good example. Uh, I'm from Greece. Mm -hmm. And when I did my PhD, one in England, one of the courses that we had to attend was how to conduct interviews. So I attended also a method methodology course. And why we had to be taught like this? Because we had to conduct around 300 interviews in the PhD. So we need to learn all the techniques and everything. So look what they did to me. So they asked all the other students, our colleagues, to go in one room. And they put me in a room with a person from Turkey. And they gave us a scenario of a simulation exercise, but we inverted the roles. So I play the guy from Turkey, and he plays the guy from Greece. And that time, our countries had a conflict, let's say, a geopolitical conflict. You understand? And everybody else watched in the other room via camera. That was one of the most fruitful exercises I have ever experienced. 
and I had to be on his side and on my side, and I had to use arguments that I actually didn't believe. Yeah. But after that, when we both sit down and drink a coffee and think about that, that was very, very productive. But nobody told us a story or a certain script to read. We had to discover ourselves, and that's the key. The key is in you, it's not what the professors say. Otherwise, you know what in Harvard they say, those that cannot do, teach. Exactly. So it's, it's up to you how to take this story. And because all the education and all the experience, they belong to you and nobody else, no matter how rich you are, if you are on an aristocrat, it doesn't matter. This stays with you, but you also need to embark on a self-discovery trip. Mm -hmm. So Thank this you. is just some segments and the beginning of what you have to learn. Okay, thank you for the explaining. And do you also believe that the status quo is also important? Of course. Okay. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, I may add just a little thing out of the point of view of film directing. When, when, when I was studying like you now, you are studying or you work? Yeah, yeah okay. So, so. Um, uh, I, I always try to, to solve the problems which were in the courses and so on. And, but then I started to, to do a research work. And I go a bit in the Greece history of myth. And, and I, I uh, found a, a, a word, perhaps it's false in the term, but you should help me. Apori, aporia. That means that, questions. Yeah, that means for, or meant for me that there are problems which are not solvable. That, that, that the insight that a problem could be not solvable in the moment. And that helps me a lot because then I thought, ah, I don't have to solve any, every problem at a moment. And for me as a film director, I saw films in another way because then I uh, understood films which end uh, like Comedies, when they haven't solved any problems, but they were happy anyway, because they said life has a sense in itself. So, or you choose tragedies, there are sometimes when you have not solvable problems, all the people are dead, like Hamlet or so. Uh, that's, a, that's the main difference between comedy and tragedy. And uh, that reminds me a bit uh, on your question. Sometimes you only have to stop and don't have to say, the professor has to say me now yes or no. You have to find out your, your own way and perhaps it's not solvable in the moment, the problem, but perhaps next week. You know what I mean. It's, yeah. it's also uh, a process, a journey, and sometimes you have, a, uh, have films where, where the hero makes a big journey and in the end nothing changed, but in himself a little bit changed, and that's all about, and that's great. Take, for example, the book uh, Ulysses, mm. which yeah. has nothing mm. to do with the Homer Ulysses yes. mm. of James Joyce, yes. James Joyce. Yeah. which actually describes, it's a huge volume, okay, but okay. I advise you to read it. It describes just one day. <laughs> But only 10% of the readers, they have managed to read this book. It describes one day of the life of a person. And this Odyssey, it's also this collection of different stories, okay, okay. to a big narrative. This is a huge lesson, if you, if you manage to read this, and then also read the original from Homer, mm -hmm. who is the adventure of a person that tries to return home, and it takes 10 years. Okay. And what you have to realize is that there were other poets or literature people that they say it's actually the trip that is important, not the end. It's not like we can, you can take a pill and you have all this knowledge and then you give you the degree, that's it. These are the best years of your lives. Unfortunately, I realized that when I was old enough. <laughs> so you need to cherish and embrace all this. It's, it's the trip to the end that is the most important. Okay, I will try to read this book. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I believe our students from Hamburg have um, a full day still ahead of you. Um, so I'll take this as a nice closing, the journey that's ahead of you. Uh, it is actually the journey that makes it. Um, you got lots of advice today, and that's because of uh, experiences we had. <laughs> And um, I would like to thank once again wholeheartedly for being with us, Professor Kuvirtis, Sagi, Andreas. It was a beautiful discussion. For me, it could have moved on and on, but yeah, time it is. 
Um, for the audience out there, um, please stay tuned with us. It, this was our first Café Artistic for 23, but there's of course more to come. Um, we will definitely have, we were just ideating about it, maybe a joint session, Café Scientific, Café uh, Artistic. So for us, we mentioned it, we are always innovating, we are always thinking, we are progressive, and we are um, thinking about new ways of getting yeah, knowledge out there, straight from Berlin, straight from Hamburg, straight from Paris, Athens, wherever we are. And um, please stay tuned with us, check our websites, um, leave comments for us. As we mentioned, um, doors are always open. This is our policy here. And thank you so much for being with us. See you soon. Bye-bye.